Hi, my name is Paul and welcome to episode 12 of my monthly portfolio series, where I invest $100 every month. Now, before getting into the video, I do follow a set of rules when investing in this portfolio, and I also have a set of goals that I'm trying to achieve. If you're interested in learning more about those, then I'd suggest going into the description box below this video, where there will be a document outlining everything in detail. Alternatively, you could go back and watch the earlier episodes of the series, where I go over all of that as well. And you can do so by clicking on the monthly series playlist, which is also linked in the description box. With that out of the way, let's go over what happened in the portfolio's fiscal November. At the start of the month, as always, I added $100 of cash to the portfolio, and I had an additional $2.16 in received dividends. So I invested all of that money into five Morgard North American residential REIT shares, two shares of Knight Therapeutics, and 0.24 shares of MTY Food Group. As of the market's close on December 1st, 2022, the $102.16 that I invested has appreciated by 9.47% to $111.84 when accounting for the dividends received in the month. This month's best performer was MTY Food Group, whose shares increased in price by 7.66%, which I'd assume was mostly from the Wetzel's Pretzels acquisition, which happened at the beginning of last month as well as the general market rally on the back of the Fed announcing that they would be decelerating rate increases, since there wasn't really anything else in terms of news from MTY this month. Now, the company did release a sustainability report this month, but while it is nice to see those added levels of transparency from the company, uh, they never really tend to have any significant impact on share price. Outside of that, MTY did add four new retail products according to the Grocery Collection website, but these have been pretty up and down over the past few months, so not really too much to be excited about there either. But next month we should be getting an announcement for the completion of the Wetzel's Pretzels acquisition, so that's definitely something to look forward to. The next best performer for the portfolio this month was the Morgard North American Residential REIT, whose shares appreciated in price by 7.3%, and like MTY, Morgard had no material news come out this month. So, this increase was probably similarly due to the broader market's rally. Last up was Knight Therapeutics, who, despite the market's rally, managed to decline in price over the month of November. Now, Knight reported earnings this month, and the market reacted pretty negatively to the results. But after reading the report and listening to the conference call, I found that everything was perfectly in line with expectations. Revenues were slightly down, but the hematology and oncology segment reported organic portfolio growth, and so did the infectious diseases segment. But these gains were offset by lower demand, specifically for products used to treat infections associated with COVID-19. Noting that, this decline was expected, since COVID has been steadily becoming less prevalent and less harmful as vaccination rates have increased, and Knight's management has brought this up on every conference call so far this year. The decline in the other specialty products segment was also completely expected, as it was also mentioned in previous conference calls as pertaining to advanced supply purchases by customers in the previous quarters. So, despite the price decline, things really weren't all that bad. In fact, the management even raised guidance, projecting that the full-year revenues would be at least $5 million higher than was previously expected. Now, the gross margin was also down, but again, this was expected and has been gradually occurring over the last few quarters because of the Exelon deal. This involves operations being run by night only after they gain regulatory approval to take over Exelon in the different countries where Exelon is marketed and distributed. Knight, however, has an agreement in which the prior owner of Exelon is continuing the operations of the drug in the countries where Knight is awaiting approval. But that company has to send the profits directly over to Knight Therapeutics. And this means that Knight isn't recording revenues for Exelon in those countries. And this artificially boosts margins until Knight is approved to take over operations. Which is exactly what has been happening here. Putting that aside and going over to the income statement, it could be that people looked, albeit not carefully, at the negative net operating income and used this to make a decision to sell shares. But this mostly had to do with the amortization of the intangible assets as well as a minor one-time impairment, which also reduced the value of those intangible assets. Intangible assets, however, are paid for well ahead of time and are held on the balance sheet. And when they're amortized, the value of those assets are essentially just being marked down in value and don't actually contribute to a real cash loss. Because of this, 
These inclusions can inaccurately skew the perception of a business's profitability. So instead, I like to check the impact that these have on the balance sheet, since that will give a more accurate portrayal of the change in the net asset value. And we'll get to that shortly. But while we're still on the income statement, there are a few other line items here that can add to the confusion when trying to figure out the company's earnings. Those being the fair value net loss on financial assets and foreign currency exchange and hyperinflation related gains and losses. First, the gains and losses on financial assets are unrealized, meaning they don't represent the sale of securities and have no impact on the business's operations, while foreign exchange and hyperinflation are not to be counted on as a recurring source of losses. Or, in this quarter's case, these actually manage to produce the company gains. See, all of these combine with the actually useful line items and make up the net income, which gives a fairly inaccurate portrayal of profitability. Instead, I like to look at the cash flows from operating activities, which in this quarter was $11.3 million, and came alongside a note that next quarter's operating cash flows will be negatively impacted by the Exelon transfer but that this should go back to normal in early 2023. Anyway, if we take this number and subtract the capital expenditures, we get a free cash flow of $10.77 million, which is a much more accurate portrayal of how much money the business is earning. And this, again, is completely in line with previous quarters. Checking on the balance sheets, we can see that the impact of the amortization and impairment of intangible assets clearly did not materially create a negative outcome for total shareholder equity, which increased in spite of the company repurchasing over 800,000 shares for cancellation within the quarter. And the money for these buybacks essentially comes directly out of the balance sheet. On that note, we also received some subsequent information that the company repurchased another 887,000 shares as of November 9th, which have yet to be accounted for. Just to remind everyone, this is one of the central themes of my Knight Therapeutics investment hypothesis. Knight is a challenging company for most people to understand, and the management is keen on continuously repurchasing shares at low prices, leaving the shareholders with a larger share of the free cash flows. This strategy becomes evident once you take a look at the shares outstanding. Over the last four years, the company's total shares outstanding have come down by 20%. Meanwhile, the business has continued to slowly grow and churn out cash. Monish Pabrai aptly refers to this strategy as cannibalism, and he recently released a video about Henry Singleton, who efficiently utilized this strategy while running Teledyne. And in that video, he breaks down how the strategy can provide incredible value over time. So if you're interested in seeing his explanation of how constant repurchases can lead to significant shareholder growth over the long run, then I'd recommend that you set aside some time and watch or at least listen to that video, which I'll link in the description to make your life a little bit easier. Going back over to Knight Therapeutics, this month the shares declined in price by 1.11%. This slightly offset the month's portfolio gains, but not enough to keep the portfolio from breaking $1,100. So as of the end of November, the portfolio is officially back in the black by a mere 14 cents. Unfortunately, this isn't quite enough to make up for the reinvested dividends, but getting back to a positive unrealized gain on the $1,100 that I contributed is way better than I was expecting at the start of November. This month, the benchmarks also performed incredibly well, and all of the ETFs that I tracked had similarly positive results, ranging from gains between 6.48% and 9.42%. So in terms of the monthly comparison, I again managed to outperform the benchmarks, though only because of the dividends that I received. Noting that, I once again just barely edged out the global value ETF by the same 0.05% margin as last month, and this month there were again no dividends received by the benchmark portfolios to help them out. Unfortunately, despite my winning portfolio performance this month, my portfolio is still bringing up the rear when looking at the total portfolio returns since inception. The next worst performer is the S&P 500 ETF, which is worth $37.90 more than mine. Meanwhile, the best performer is yet again the Global Value ETF, which has continued to shoot straight upwards past even my monthly goal line, which represents an annualized 12% return. My portfolio, however, still has a ways to go to catch up, 
but I'm now past the break-even marker and I'm only trailing my monthly goal by about $55, which is a major step up from last month's $116 deficit. Now, I've got to say that since I've started this project, there's mostly just been a lot of really negative news surrounding the market. So, at the risk of jinxing the recent reversal of the market's downward trend, I'm pretty glad that my series has been able to highlight what it looks like to stick things out, even when sentiment is at very low levels. Next month's video will mark one full year since I've started the $100 per month portfolio challenge, and I'm excited to continue on and show how portfolios that have been accumulating shares during a bear market will perform once sentiment starts to become more bullish. That said, I have no idea what next year will have in store, but whether the market goes up or down, I'll definitely still be investing my money into my best ideas, even if I still only have three of them. On that note, I was initially worried that MTY's rising share price had pushed the stock out of the discount range where I'd be willing to buy it at. But after checking the free cash flows, I think that the price still has quite a ways to go before I'd consider it to be fairly valued. So I've deposited my $100 of monthly contribution, and I also have $3.08 in dividends to invest. And my plan is to purchase four shares of Morgard, since they're still the most undervalued in my opinion. Then I'm going to buy three shares of Knight Therapeutics and spend the remainder on a fraction of an MTY food group share. So let's get into Wealth Simple and see what actually happens. Okay, so I'm here inside the portfolio and we currently have $103.08 to spend. So first I'm going to invest in four shares of Morgard. And confirm it. Okay. Okay, so that leaves us with $37.16 left. We're going to buy three shares of Knight Therapeutics. And confirm. And now there's $20.66 left. And I'm going to try and put all of that into MTY Food Group. So $20.66. Let's buy And there we go. So that's pending. All right, and there's no money left available to trade. So I'll see you back when the MTY order comes through, which should be usually around three o'clock. Okay, I'm back and I've successfully purchased four shares of Morgard for $16.48 each. I also got three shares of Knight Therapeutics for $5.50 each. And finally, I purchased 0.335 shares of MTY Food Group, and I got it for a price of $61.73 per whole share. So, as of the market close on Friday, December the 2nd, the portfolio now holds 52 shares of Morgard worth about $857, approximately 3.28 shares of MTY Food Group worth roughly $200, and 25 shares of Knight Therapeutics worth $136.50. Also, there was one pesky cent left over in the portfolio after the purchase of MTY's fractional share came in. Moving into the dividend tracking portion of the video, November once again marked the portfolio's largest monthly payout with $3.08, which was substantially higher than October's record of $2.16 in earned dividends. Next month, however, is expected to be a slight step backwards, with $2.88 expected. And that's just because MTY paid out $0.57 cents in quarterly dividends on the 16th of November, so I won't likely be getting any more money from MTY until February rolls around. That said, Morgard's current $2.51 in monthly distributions is expected to make up the full $2.88 of next month's dividend earnings. This increase is due to both the portfolio's addition of five shares, as well as the REIT's distribution raise, which will be in effect in December. As for the cumulative dividends earned, the portfolio has now received a total of $14.23 which will hopefully continue to grow and compound as quickly as it has been in previous months. Unfortunately, 
Last month, I completely forgot to update the book value of my holdings on the yield on cost chart, which made the yields a fair bit higher than they actually were. So I am sorry for the screw up, but the issue should be fixed going forwards since I set up the spreadsheet to automatically update the book values. As for this month, the annual portfolio dividend yield, assuming no changes occur over the next 12 months, is going to be $40.20, which is up 8.77% from last month's annual yield of $36.96. This makes the portfolio's total yield on contributed capital 3.35%. Now, to finish off with what I'd be able to buy with this month's distributions, I actually went to a library book sale and bought all of these business and investing books for $1 each. So this month's distributions would be enough to cover the cost of three of these books. Now, I haven't had a chance to read any of them yet, but I did recognize some of the authors and titles from previous research and word of mouth, and the rest just had topics that caught my attention. Out of curiosity, I'd be interested in hearing which of these three books you would consider buying if you only had $3 to spend. So feel free to leave a comment on that, and if you've actually happened to read any of these, then please let me know your opinions. Anyway, that's going to be the end of this video, but before you go, please be aware that this video is not financial advice, and I am not a financial advisor. This video was made entirely for the purpose of providing inspiration and insight into my personal investment decisions, and it should not be used as a substitute for you doing your own research. This video does not have the information required to make good investment decisions on individual securities. So again, I am not a financial advisor. I'm just a Canadian who likes to invest and share my opinions with others. And in doing so, I hope that I was able to provide you with something of value. And if I did, please consider sharing it with anyone else who may also benefit from it. Thank you for sticking with me all the way to the end, and enjoy the rest of your day.